the World Energy Transition Outlook has been already released in, in June this year, but I, I think it's still uh, actual to uh, consider the scenario that we have been uh, uh, built to be coherent with the 1.5 uh, degrees uh, uh, of the Paris Agreement goals. And uh, especially uh, a few weeks after the, 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 the COP26 in, uh, in, uh, in Glasgow. First of all, uh, uh, I wish to make clear the, the, that the energy transition is already in place. So it, it's happening. And there are many trends that make clear how this is, uh, uh, this is uh, the reality that we have uh, in front of, uh, of us. And the main trends uh, are surely the sharp declining of uh, the cost of renewables. I think you all may, may recall us uh, 10 years ago, important think tank or agency we are saying that coal was the fuel of the future for electricity. If you look into the books, you can see that this was already happening 10 or 11 years ago. And uh, not many were really believing that uh, uh, the solar panel, building solar panel, could consume less energy how they can provide more energy, the energy that was needed to produce the panel themselves. It seems now centuries ago, but uh, it's 10, 12 years ago, not, no later than, uh, than, uh, than that. Or that renewables were a kind of, uh, of niche, was a, an ideological approach to the energy system, the dream of, the, of, the, of a few. Today, the fact, the reality is that uh, renewables are in a, in a larger part of the world, the most cheap option to produce electricity. And you can see this from uh, these uh, graphs where all the renewable technology are now in the full range cost of uh, the fossil fuel generation plant. And they are becoming year after year more, more convenient. This could be also easily expressed and seen in this, uh, in this slide, where we will see the installer capacity uh, of renewables. So the, the capacity that has been added year after year. And you can see from the graph how is now eight, nine years, that systematically, the other capacity of renewables are, is outpacing the installer capacity of the traditional fuels, including nuclear. And uh, the zero between the two paths, the other capacity, adding capacity of renewables and adding capacity of the traditional fossil fuel and nuclear, the CISO of the two paths is enlarging year after year. And uh, you can see how in the last year, that was in a year of the pandemic, the uh, added capacity of renewables was 50% more than the previous year. So 260 gigawatts of uh, renewables at the capacity in 2020. This is the 80% of the total added capacity. The remain 20% is for the fossil fuel, uh, added fossil fuel added capacity. So we have seen that the trend in prices has been determined, this uh, trend in the, in the added capacity. And there are other trends that are significant in this context. One that you can see in the slide, is the one related to the, uh, um, to the, the hydrogen 
in particular to the green hydrogen. And as you can see, the trend show that uh, uh, thanks to the innovation, uh, scaling up manufacturing and others, the price of uh, the producing green hydrogen is going down. I'll, always in this last week uh, uh, to trying to, to show how dramatic has been this uh, uh, trend uh, in the last period. I remember that in the summer last year, Bloomberg come and say that uh, green hydrogen was going to be competitive in 2050 with the cost of uh, $2 per kilo. Arena came by the end of the, the last year, 2020, with a report saying that uh, our assessment was the green hydrogen was going to be already competitive in this decade before 2030. And then in the last General Assembly, you know, Arena is uh, uh, this uh, unique animal where we put government because we are in an intergovernmental uh, agency, but we favor the dialogue with, uh, with the private sectors, with the stakeholders. Companies uh, came to the General Assembly. I, I remember there was also a representative from the SNAM, uh, Marco Alvera, say that in, in their opinion, uh, green hydrogen was going to be competitive already in 2025. And now we discover that already today, a, a company from Saudi Arabia, Aquapawa, they are sending ship of uh, green hydrogen or, or the molecule of uh, green hydrogen, ammonia ethanol to the Asian countries like Japan or South Korea. And they say that uh, green hydrogen is already competitive today. And also the uh, US administration, they say that uh, this uh, hydrogen shot to have uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen already competitive in 2030 with $1 per kilogram. So. Just to give you an idea that in a six, nine months, 12 months, the perspective has changed completely. So how is uh, in, in uh, progress this, uh, this, uh, this revolution? And uh, the next slide is on, uh, on the electrolyzer. You know, there are too many uh, uh, element of costs on green hydrogen. One are the renewables, because uh, green hydrogen is produced by water and the renewable energy. So one is the cost of renewables, and the other cost is the uh, cost of electrolyzer. And we can see that uh, uh, we are going to have always cheaper electricity produced by by renewables, and uh, ones that. Uh, we have a sufficient demand, also the cost of the electrolyzer, they are already going down. They will go down more dramatically. So we can have a kind of a trend that uh, will follow in some way the trend of, uh, of, uh, of uh, decreasing cost of renewables. So here, just to give you the sense how the transition is, uh, is in place. But if we all uh, may agree that the transition is in place, we also may agree that uh, the speed and the scale of the transition is not enough to be in line with the Paris Agreement's goal of uh, keep the rising of the temperature below the 1.5 degrees by the end of this century. If we compare with a with a post revolution time, post industrial revolution time. So this is a reason for us to come up with a, the world energy transition outlook to respond uh, uh, to the question: uh, What is the pathway that is possible? Uh, this is consistent with the 1.5 degree goals. So us and us work is not a, a forecast. Is what should happen. 
for making the goals really achievable. So we use our models that uh, have been calibrated along the years to study the energy transition. And we are the only agency that have dedicated instrument, analytical instrument for this, and also for trying to understand what is the socioeconomic impact of this transformation. So if you may agree, at least this is our, our, uh, our thinking, that the, the energy system of the future is under the work of two main drivers that are the electrification of the system and the energy efficiency. So these are the two main drivers. And the enablers, enablers of uh, this driver are renewable energy complemented by green hydrogen and sustainable and use of sustainable biomass. This where we are going. And this is in our point of view, no discutable anymore. But what has to happen? And we see in this uh, following slide, what could be the contribution for uh, uh, working on uh, the mitigation of uh, the CO2 emissions. We see the contribution from renewables and the efficiency, the electrification, the hydrogen, uh, the fossil fuel CO2 removals, and the biomass. So these are in the, in the VITO, in the World Energy Transition Outlook, the contribution of, of this element to the uh, a mitigation of, uh, uh, of uh, the CO2 uh, emission. And this is what is consistent with what I was just saying concerning electricity and energy efficiency as a two main driver and the renewables, green hydrogen and sustainable biomass as the, the, uh, the enablers of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, transition. And uh, we have, uh, on this, this uh, we build our theory of change. So there are the main rules in some way that uh, design the uh, our theory of uh, of uh, of change that you can see there. So the main elements are the uh, the uh, how to say the assumption that uh, the main effort has to be produced in these 10 years. So we uh, say very clearly that uh, at the end of this decade, we will know if we will be able, if we have hopes to stay in the Paris Agreement uh, uh, goal. So this means that the major part of investment and action has to be having place in this decade. And this is a very important assumption because we make also evident that if this decade we have to produce the major efforts to be aligned with the Paris Agreement, technologies that cannot produce results in this decade are not really able to favor the change. So this reason for us to identify three main technological avenue that we, we have to call in this way, renewables, green hydrogen, or hydrogen biomass. Other technologies cannot have an impact in this decade. So possibly they could be relevant, but not for fighting climate change as we have to do now and to be consistent with the 
So there are other uh, key points. Also, another controversial aspect is the use of uh, CCS, where we, in our, uh, in our uh, uh, modeling, we, we take care that the CCS could be uh, taking place on a transitionary period in the country that are so much dominated by, by the use of uh, fossil fuel as like gas. So in that countries, you cannot just kill the economy because you will also close any possibility to, to go for, for the transformation of the energy system. So in, in limited to those uh, uh, area, we think that CCS could be, could be useful. Then there is the uh, adapting market. Yeah, we have a book on electricity markets. We have already seen this in a chapter, how to design the market for the new energy system. Because the market design is a result of a system where a centralized system was in place, dominated by fossil fuel. Now there is another system that will be more decentralized based on renewables. So the market design is inevitably something that may bring us to a different uh, solution, different tools. Naturally, all these uh, uh, all these uh, graphs are taken by by the World Energy Transition Outlook and are, are really accessible for free on our website. Um, we have uh, now in the one new page in on the website called Education, and there you can uh, have easily access to our flagship reports. Shortly, we will come also with the infographics that can make easier for, for scholars to use our work for their teaching. And we have also opened a, a session of, uh, on technical papers that are papers from the people working in ARENA, but also people, people or a scholar out of, uh, of ARENA for having debates, scientific uh, reports on that. So if you, you can get very easily, go to the education page and you will find all of these, uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, graphs. Naturally, we need investment. And uh, uh, the veto is trying to, to compare systematically uh, what are the uh, already planned investment with the investment we need. And the graph say very clear that so we need uh, 33 more trillion of US dollar. This means uh, 4.5 trillion dollars per year of investment in the energy transition compared to the 3.3 that have been already committed. So it will be 1.1 more US dollar, a trillion US dollar per year in investment in the energy transition. And uh, furthermore, we need also to move some of uh, the planet investment or the support for the fossil fuel sector to the uh, clean energy transition part. So this is more, that seems a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. We said that we have to triple investment to renewables every year. Also, if we compare with uh, the uh, record uh, years of last year on other capacity, but we have to move further three times for getting where we are with, uh, with uh, we should be. But so, you know, 4.5 trillion, so I, I, I think the investment, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, 20, it depends on the year, from 20, 22, 25% of uh, GDP. So what we are asking that uh, the 20% of uh, the total investment is to go to the energy transition. That it means uh, one, uh, uh, one, uh, one fifth of uh, the total investment. So it's a, it's a huge amount, but it's amount is compatible with, uh, with uh, uh, the financial resource that we may have. One other aspect uh, that is important to, to notice that uh, uh, naturally uh, investment in our analysis are not considering only a cost, but are considering investment. 
This means that uh, uh, in our estimate, if we consider also the externality, it depends on how we consider the externality, uh, for every dollar spent on uh, the energy transition, we may have uh, a saving up to two times, from two times to 5.5 times. It depends on how you count, how you uh, count for, uh, for the uh, externalities. And uh, we, have, we will have also a contribution in terms of, uh, of uh, other important economic variable. But for making clear is that uh, uh, we at the Vito, we look at uh, the energy transition, not only from the side of uh, investment and technologies, but also in the relationship of the energy transition to the full economy, the society, and then naturally the, the planet. So it's important also that we have uh, the right policies in place. So it's so-called enabling policies, the integrating policies to ensure that uh, the structural change that are needed in terms of markets, and also ensuring that uh, there will be a process that's a law for uh, the reskilling, retraining of the workers that are losing their jobs for transitioning, transitioning into new, into new, in the new system. And uh, uh, with our model, we have tried also to uh, assess the contribution in terms of GDP. And you see that already in 2030, the contribution is uh, around 2.4%. We have also linked this with the uh, response to the COVID pandemic. We publish an agenda for the post COVID response, making clear how in only three years, we can have a contribution in terms of GDP of 1.1 per year. If we go for uh, uh, a policy that are consistent with the medium long term trajectory that we need for be coherent with the Paris Agreement. And then in the first three years and the first decade, there must be the most important efforts in terms of investment. This is also the reason for see that the contribution of, of GDP that will remain positive, will have the major inputs in, uh, in uh, major results in, the, this, uh, in this decade. And this is not only for, uh, for uh, GDP, but also for, for jobs we count that uh, uh, we have just published a report with, uh, with the International Labor Organization. And uh, we count 500 million, 500,000 more jobs uh, in 2020 uh, related to the energy transition. Now we have 12 million jobs in the, in the sector and uh, they will grow uh, and the total in this for the renewables, the total for the energy transition are, or the clean system are 43 millions today, and they should should be 122 millions in 2050, and we will have uh, 43 millions on, on renewables. So we'll have that uh, what we are trying to to say, what the number say to us, is that moving to the any transition at the scale and speed that is needed. This will also provide for a, a, a strong contribution in terms of uh, GDP, in terms of jobs that are the usual uh, index for, uh, uh, for uh, assessing the uh, socioeconomic impact of uh, the energy transition. We have also developed in our, in, our, in our last outlook, the first energy transition index, they're trying to, it's called uh, the, the, the welfare index for the energy transition. This is taking into account of many elements that you can see listed in the, in the, in the slides. And actually in the video, you will uh, find the, 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 the way we have, uh, we have put all these elements uh, together. So it will be important to, to see how this index will evolve year after, after, after years. And uh, uh, with this, I think I can, uh, I, I can uh, stop.
my my presentation and uh, i thank you for your attention